I'm so happy to have the opportunity to speak today to Susie Marku Shafflin. And Susie, thank you so much for joining me. <clears throat> How's your day going so far? Thank you for having me. My day has been so good. It's a beautiful sunny day in LA and I have a new program starting tomorrow and a full plate and so much to be excited about. That's cool. Can you tell me what your program is tomorrow? So actually it's, it's the level two part of my sound healing training. It's the first time that we've, we've offered this level two, which is a year long business mentorship program. So Nice. That's beginning tomorrow. So I'm in full on prep mode for that. And it's so nice to have this time to sort of detach and drop in and connect with you. <laughs> well, thank you. Right. I'm sure it took a lot of work to come up with a year's worth of curriculum. It's That's been, perfect. it's been a long time coming and I'm so excited. It's going to be, I think the best year ever for everyone in the group. <laughs> Nice. You know, on that note, I saw you post recently a story about your evolution from where you were to where you are now. And you talked a lot about how you've maybe had, a, you've had a bit of a rags to riches sort of experience. Like you got started uh, with just, let me buy a sound bowl. And now you're having a really successful, running a very successful program. So I guess on that note, where should we begin? Uh, where, how far back do you want to go? to start. <laughs> I'm happy to go as far history. back as you'd like. I mean, like, yes, there's been an incredible journey of starting my business and sharing sound healing, but I think there's also a lot of, of magic and importance in what led me to sound healing in the first place, you know? Um, so I'm happy to, I'm happy to go into that. Or if you want, if you want to talk more about the business side of things, I love to chat about that too. <laughs> I'd like to start where you had the transformation of becoming a sound healer and or your first experience with sound healing. Mm. So my first experience with sound healing was in 2016. Um, well, experience with sound healing as I now know and share and teach sound healing. Um, and in 2016, I was in the process of moving across the country. I had been living on the East Coast in New York City, um, and I moved to Los Angeles to sort of have a fresh start. Um, I'd been struggling for many, many years at that point with a couple of, of pretty big challenges. Um, I experienced a condition called alopecia areata, which is essentially unexplained hair loss, um, and I don't know if it was the alopecia that caused me to really struggle with anxiety or if anxiety sort of contributed to the alopecia and hair loss, but um, anxiety was a big part of my journey. And um, both of those things led me to go down a path of drinking alcohol, you know, and taking drugs and going down, yeah, a, a pretty deep experience of alcoholism and addiction in my teens and 20s, um, which led me to hit rock bottom in 2015 when I after almost taking my own life, you know, I was just so hopeless and frustrated and sick of being sick and tired. Um, that I, I said, I want to find another way and I'm open to whatever that looks like. So, um, after going to rehab and starting to meditate and starting a gratitude practice, I ended up moving to California at which point I was still struggling to stay sober. Um, but in the process of moving, my aunt who lives out here, she said, hey, do you want to come to a sound bath? And that very first sound bath opened up a whole new, really life and, and world and possibilities of healing for me. Nice. Do you remember what type of sensations and or thoughts you had in that first sound bath? Yeah, I do. Um, I remember it really well. It was one of those moments that stands out like a frame from a movie, you know? Um, I remember going into it not feeling like, I, like I, a lot of people ask me now, um, you know, what is a sound bath? Do I have to get naked? Am I getting in water? Like I, I didn't wonder what it was. I was sort of just like, I'm down for this. Like whatever it is. <laughs> I never thought of that. Like, am I getting naked and getting in water? A sound bath. I'm going to get in a bathtub. Yeah. Water will have some sound penetrating it. And that's hilarious. And that's a good point. That makes sense. Yeah, but yeah. I didn't have that sense. So going into it, I was sort of like, sure, sounds like a relaxing thing. I'm open to crystals. I'm open to woo-woo things. Um, I didn't really know. I didn't really ask. I went. I was just sort of open and curious. Yeah. And also, like, 
in a space of being pretty anxious at the same time. So I remember when I got there and I laid down, I was like, I hope this works, but I don't know if it will work because my mind is really, really loud. And as much as I try to meditate, you know, it it never really quiets down. So like I was open, but also a little skeptical and feeling a little anxious and I just lay down and the guide, her name's Arlene. She led a beautiful sound bath. She guided us through some chakra toning. And then she started to play the crystal singing bowls. And, you know, at first my mind was really chattering. I was like, okay, what's happening? Am I going to relax? You know, those stream of thoughts started to come in. And then within a few minutes, it was like, they began to quiet in a way they hadn't before. And my body began to relax. And I began to feel sort of this tingly physical sensation but at the same time like not as much in my body as I normally am it was like I was here but I wasn't here and I was able to really disconnect from like the world that felt so present and heavy to me in my daily life and reconnect with what really felt like home it felt like what I'd been searching for all those years of like oh my gosh my hair is falling out you know, are people going to notice I'm drinking alcohol now? I'm feeling ashamed. I'm super hungover. Like, are people to all those thoughts and loops? Like, I just wanted to feel peace and quiet and kind of like I was okay. Yeah. Amazing, Susie. Can you, can you talk a little bit about like what sort of thoughts you've had over the years in relation to hair loss? So that's been a journey um, for most of my life, um, I was not okay with it. <laughs> you know, I, I grew up for the first seven years of my life with really beautiful blonde hair. And I mean, even until I shaved my head, I still had beautiful blonde hair. I just had bald spots and, um, having blonde hair was actually a big part of my identity. Um, I have three younger sisters and they also have beautiful blonde hair. And we were known in my hometown as the four blonde shuffling girls. So, when my hair started to fall out, it was like, what's wrong with me? You know, and what are people going to think if they know that I have a bald spot or multiple bald spots? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I can, I can and can't imagine because I'm turning 50 soon. I'm starting to get a nice little, nice little patch up here. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it, it is a hard thing to come to terms with, but I think would obviously you would agree that maybe for men, it's not as challenging as it is for women. Is that an assumption or am I? I mean, yes and no, because I've spoken to so many men who have gone through their own hair loss journeys. And I think you can't really compare, you know, at the end of the day, yeah. it's how we hold it for ourselves. And I think as a woman, there typically and many men are also attached to their hair routines and coloring their hair and cutting their hair and all of sort of the glamour that goes along with having hair um and yes that tends to be more for women but I don't think it's exclusive by any means and Mm. I mean I think it indicates something different sometimes when when men lose their hair you know it's like especially if a young I mean one of one of my family members started to lose his hair in his twenties, you know, was experiencing male pattern baldness and like it caused him so much suffering, you know, it's like, this isn't supposed to be happening yet, yeah. you know? Yeah. Good point. How do you now set your thinking processes up for success in relation to being judgmental on yourself and, or do, do you feel like you're, you've healed? from having any attachment to what you're talking about, or is it still a journey? So I think there's no finish line in any healing journey. And in ways it does still come up last year, I got married. And so it felt a little bit triggering to be like, wow, okay. I imagine myself, whether I knew it or not, like as a bride wearing a veil and having my hair done for my wedding, how can I, create an experience for myself as a bald bride that still feels elegant in the way that I have dreamed of, you know? So there's different layers, but for the most part, I think I've now come to a place where I hold the experience of losing my hair and ultimately shaving it as as my greatest teacher, you know, and accepting it, getting to a place where I could even consider accepting it was a huge journey 
you know, for many years I got cortisone injections, like literally every month, hundreds of injections in my scalp wow. of steroids. Wow. Um, I tried every cream I've been to every type of healer imaginable. I wore wigs. I used hairspray, I used clips. And like what I ultimately realized was I had put myself in my own prison, right. Where like, it was consuming so much of my energy, so much of my mental capacity that I was like, is this actually serving me for what, you know? Good point. And then the other thing is like, it's quite selfish. It's quite selfish thinking, you know, like nobody else is thinking about my hair. No one else cares about my hair as much as I do. Like <laughs> if they even noticed when I had bald spots and now, I mean, as a bald woman, people notice because it's different than most women, but like people don't really actually care and a, a lot less. And if they do, it's from a place of curiosity or from a place of wanting to connect, you know, like people who see me are like, either like, Oh, wow. Is that, you know, a fashion statement? Is it a spiritual statement? Are you okay? Are you, are you experiencing cancer or chemo? Which that was something I was really afraid of when I shaved my head. I was afraid people would think I was sick because I had done so much work at that point to get my body really, really healthy. Like mm -hmm best health of my life. You know, I got sober. I hadn't drank alcohol for a couple of years at that point. I hadn't been taking drugs. I was moving my body, meditating, eating really well. And my hair was still falling out. So I was like, I don't want people to think I'm sick when I'm not, but it's like, but I'm not sick. So why do I care what people think? You know? <laughs> Great point, Susie. I mean, that's amazing. I mean, yesterday, uh, for everyone listening, go follow Susie on Instagram at, at the Copper Vessel. Yesterday, I got a chance to tune in very shortly because I was jumping in my car, but I saw that you went live um, on Instagram. And so right away, you had such a big smile on your face like you do now. Anyone listening, if you want to go to YouTube, you can watch watch uh, Susie. But um, I just, you you glow. You have an amazing glow. You you look really happy. You're smiling. And I think, I don't know, I just think that's really cool that you've overcome that major obstacle. Thank you. Thank you. And I think it's possible. I know it's possible for me. And I think it's possible for any of us. We all have things that we hold as unacceptable, you know, things that, I mean, not everyone, but I think most people as humans, there's something, whether it's losing your hair, whether it's a scar, whether it's I hate my thighs or whether it's this or that, or I had a divorce, right? We hold things that think I'm not whole or I'm broken or I'm unlovable or I'm damaged because of this. And when we can find a way to accept it and say this thing that's causing me so much pain and, and I'm a prisoner to is actually the key to my freedom and my liberation, nice. right? Yeah. And yeah. we accept it and just let it go, which again, is easier said than done. Um, but when we can get to that place, like we do, you know, you, the light comes from within. And that's what I've learned is like, my beauty is not about having blonde hair on my head. It's not about the clothing that I wear. It's not about any of that, you know? And as I continue to hopefully grow old over the years, you know, my looks will continue to change, but that's not necessarily what makes me beautiful or worthy of love. It's this light that comes from within and that lights it's in all of us. Mm. I'm really glad you brought that up. I think it's a really interesting concept around the world of anti-aging and also some of the old school yoga philosophy theory of that we can somehow like um, transubstantiate and or move from being like a physical body to a light body that there's this idea that maybe we could somehow overcome death or mm -hmm. that we might like be able to avoid death and or old age. And, and then I think there's such an incredible process to accepting this process as opposed to constantly trying to change it. So I'm, I really love hearing what you're saying. It's extremely refreshing and encouraging. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No. And yeah, I agree. D did you um have any prior like Hatha yoga and or yoga, like um, posture practice yoga experience prior to that first sound bath that you experienced? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I've been practicing yoga since I was quite young. Um, I know that I began sort of a, a committed practice when I was about 12. Um, I started practicing what was then Bikram 26 and 2 and I, I remember my parents, I would beg them, can you take me to hot yoga? And they were like, they called my doctor. They were like, is this safe? They had no idea what it was. They were like, our daughter wants to do yoga in a sauna. And I just loved it. Yeah, me too. 
and still do, you know, it's still a really grounding part of my regular practice. Um, so yes, I practice, I practice vinyasa yoga for many years. Um, I practice throughout college. I've, um, I'm trying to think my journey, my yoga journey. Um, when I was in rehab, that was sort of a nice return. You know, when I was in college, it was once in a while that I would go after college, I was drinking and partying a lot. And I remember thinking like, I need to get back to yoga when I look good in my yoga clothes, which is so, I mean, <laughs> I've heard that before. I've heard, other, right? heard like, that. Yeah. <laughs> I'll get started once I actually look good. Yeah. Yep. 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 Exactly. So my, my yoga in my twenties was not good. And I remember even a couple of times being in New York city and going to a hot yoga class in the East village. And like, at that point I was smoking cigarettes and I was hungover in class and doing a 90 minute 26 and two class is intense when you're feeling good and you just being in that class and I feel badly for the people who are around me who are probably like this girl is just not okay <laughs> um but you know it always it always was there for me it was always something that I could come home to throughout the years even when I was struggling the most like I knew that it was something that offered healing and medicine for me nice um, and then when I was in rehab they offered yoga. And I actually like, that was when I first taught, like I would teach my friends when we didn't have days when we had yoga class, I would just teach them some basic asana and we would do it together. Um, and that was sort of when I started to think, Hey, maybe I should take a teacher training. Cause it felt really fun for me to do that. Nice. How do you differ the experience that you've had in your yoga practice and sound baths? Hmm. Well, I think they're different forms of yoga. You know, I think it's all, it's all yoga. Um, and there are times when I'll incorporate um, different yogic modalities into my sound baths, whether it's pranayama practices, um, whether it's yoga nidra, um, sound healing in itself is not yoga, you know, um, Oftentimes, if I if I teach a Kundalini class, which now when I teach, I, I'm trained in Kundalini um, and Yin and Vinyasa, and primarily when I teach yoga, um, as we think of it, um, it's Kundalini. But I'll I'll incorporate sound at the end, you know, which is it's common in a Kundalini class. It's not as common to do crystal bowl sound healing at the end. It's typically a gong. Yeah. Interesting. Can you talk a little bit about the chakras and how the different bowls associate with the chakra? Yes. So each note, um, and there's Eastern and Western systems. So if you're working with um, Tibetan singing bowls, if you're working with the Tibetan system of sound healing, the notes that correspond with the chakras will be different. But in the Western system, um, we correspond, you know, the note of C to the root chakra. And then it sort of goes up from there. Um, and each, yes, each chakra um, is associated with a different frequency. And one of the really cool things about the crystal singing bowls, well, there's two things. So first of all is they have overtones. So they're not just, it's not just like play this bowl, bring healing to this chakra. Um, they're really helping to, yes, tune into one of the chakras, but also working with the whole energy system and multiple chakras at once. And that goes as well for, um, the bowls that I play, which are, if you look at them, they're colorful and they're shiny. They're different than the white frosted bowls that some people play. Um, they're called alchemy bowls and they're infused with the intentions of other crystals and gemstones and precious metals and earth elements that bring different energies into experience and also help us to touch upon other chakras. So for example, if there's the intention of emerald in a bowl that's the note of C, it would be working with the heart as well as with the root. In relation to the color green and the color of the heart chakra, is that, mm -hmm. is that how emerald is associated with the heart chakra? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. Can you talk a little bit about in your journey of recovery and also just life, how mm -hmm. you've been able to relate to the chakra system and how the chakra system perhaps has informed your life? Mm -hmm. I love to use the chakras sort of as a language and a structure to help me understand what's taking place in my life, you know, and um, it's interesting on my healing journey with alopecia, um, when I was, I think about 12, my mom took me to an energy healer and I had no idea what was going on, but at the end of the session, 
the healer said um, that I had all this light just basically shooting out of my crown chakra, out of the crown of my head. Um, and that was sort of contributing to my hair loss. You know, it was like the light was just so bright. It was blasting it out. Nice. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a great positive way to explain, right? Like instead of this, this is a horrible thing, it's because yeah. you're so, you have so much light pouring out of you. Your hair just can't handle it. Yeah. Which is so beautiful. And it also is a really kind way of saying that I wasn't fully grounded in my body, you mm. know? That's so yeah. when I think about the work that I've done for healing and, and what I really intend when I teach others to work with the chakras and work with sound and, and share energy healing is yes, it's about connecting with our light. Yes. It's about opening our third eye and our crown chakras and connecting with our divine self and re remembering that we are spiritual beings having a human experience, but we also need to let ourselves have that human experience. And what does it mean to feel safe connecting your crown to your root, you know, and rooting before we rise so that it can be in a really grounded and sustainable way. Nice. If you have a group in front of you, for example, if like right now you're just getting ready to start a sound healing and or sound bath, do you have a set formula, almost like the way like the the Hot 26 or the Bikram poses has like this, you start here and you follow in the sequential order to the end. Mm -hmm. Do you follow a similar type of concept in that, like what you mentioned, like maybe starting at the root chakra or the, the C note and working your way up? Or do you try to just get a feeling for what the room feels like and then into it, what, where and how to start? So I do have a set formula and sometimes, you know, I'll intuitively break free of that. And the formula is something that I teach in the Sound Healers Academy. Um, and I always invite the students, you know, to learn it and then make it their own based on what feels good for them. But when I begin playing bowls in a sound bath, there's formula for before for greeting and introduction and grounding and breathing. But once I actually start playing the bowls in their own right, it's not necessarily that I start with the root chakra bowl, but more so a note that would be grounding. So I could have, for example, if you're if you're seeing the video, you can see in front of me, I have this large bowl. It's 12 inches um, and the note is F. So it's working with the heart chakra, but it's a very deep and very grounding bowl. So it will help to ground the heart. And if we start with this, note, it will give us a grounding experience. So I recommend that students start with their most grounding bowl and then play intervals um, that support grounding and also um, a balanced structure. So there's different intervals that have different effects when you play two notes together. Um, the intervals of the fourth and the fifth are very stable, very grounding intervals. So I may start with a low A sharp and then play an F, right? And that would be a really grounding way to start the sound bath. It could be that my biggest bowl is a C, you know, is for the root chakra, but it doesn't have to be, you know, not everyone even has a root chakra bowl in their set and that's okay. Cool. Oh, I love hearing about this. I, uh, are, are you a musician? A no, you are not. A musician. I mean, I mean whole, so that is a form of being a musician, but did you have form or classical training and in, in music? Not in the sense that you mean. Um, I, when I was really young, played piano, um, but I stopped taking lessons because I preferred to play by ear. I played the violin for a little bit, maybe a year, but that was really it. So I'm not a classically trained musician. Over the past seven years, I've taken a lot of music lessons, um, specifically voice lessons. But in those lessons, we've talked a lot about music theory as well. So I've studied it extensively. It's something that I'm continually working towards mastering um and also something that i know i could go to juilliard and get my phd in and still have more to learn so yeah. it's something i love learning about because it it gives a beautiful structure you know it gives a beautiful structure and supports me in feeling confident then taking that structure and creating art with the with the healing and the music it is music that i create yes. yep that's so cool susie did you ever hear that theory about uh, maybe you'll, you'll probably be able to help me out here and, and tell this better than I can. But I remember hearing someone say that the relationship of the planets 
to the sun, the distance mm -hmm. of the planets to the sun, and the frequency that the planets are making around the sun are what create the notes that we know in our musical system. Have you heard mm -hmm. that before? I have heard that. I'm not too familiar in the background of that, but I know that a lot of people who play gongs, they do play planetary gongs that are tuned to the frequency. Like they might play a Jupiter gong or a sun gong. So cool. um, yeah, definitely makes sense. Nice. So when, when you're setting up a session and you, you have this formula that you follow is um, what are you, what are you thinking about? Are you, are you trying to put some sort of um, visualization and or thought process into it? Or are you trying to just clear yourself? So both, I mean, clear myself. I always say a prayer and set an intention at the beginning of every experience that I share that says, you know, God, give me the words and give me the music that will help these people the most, you know? And I think of sort of taking off my Susie hat and putting on like my divine channel hat as woo woo as that sounds, but it's like, just let me be the vessel. Let me be the vessel. And then from there, you know, when sort of the guidance comes through, it's like, okay. And of course I still have a mind. It's not like my mind turns off. So it's sort of tuning in, like, is this the guidance or is this my mind saying like, Oh, stop playing. Everyone's bored. Everyone wants to leave and go home versus like ease down the time to shift, you know, out of it is here now. So combination. That's cool. Have you had anybody during a sound bath have some type of emotional reaction that caused you to have to tend to them or is there a protocol or setup that you do for letting people know that if they have some sort of emotional upheaval that what what to do in that situation yeah so I've never had to stop a sound bath to sort of tend to or comfort someone in that way um which I think is largely in part due to the fact that um I do set up the experience by giving people guidance what to do if they feel emotional, because it's possible, you know, emotions, as you know, are energy in motion. And when these sounds move energy through our bodies and open and activate and clear our chakras, um, energy can, energy does move. And as that happens, you know, emotions can come up and sometimes it's wanting to laugh and not knowing like, why do I want to laugh? I just feel this sensation. It's like energy that wants to come out of me or, why do I feel like crying? You know, so I really invite people in the beginning to not judge it. You know, you don't even need to figure it out. It could be something from childhood or even a past life that's coming up to be clear. It's something you've been holding in your tissues that the sound has gone in and gently shaken it up so it can be finally released. And you don't have to know. I think so much of, I mean, as, as humans, but also like a lot of the culture that we live in and the path of wellness is like, let me talk about this. Let me think about this. Let me analyze this. I need to know. And it's like, what if you don't need to know? What if you could just let it go? And I think when we allow for that to happen, I mean, it allows us to really release at a deeper level. And people come out of sound baths, especially when they cry and they're like, I don't know why I was crying, but I feel so light. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Can you, can you talk a little bit about your business journey? Like when you bought your first sound bowl, did you think you would be where you are now? I guess maybe I might back up a little bit. Do you feel like you're successful now financially and career wise? I do. I really do. Nice. And I'm so grateful. And I also feel like I'm like, it's just the beginning, but the fact that, you know, I have a great stable income, you know, this month I've made more in one month than I ever made in my corporate job, you know, and that's, that's amazing to me, you know, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, because of your online platform and your ability to add education to a platform, which is allowing multiple people to join in versus working just like one at a time. Is that the idea that you're talking about? Yes, absolutely. And when I was getting started, I couldn't see it that way. And I remember the first sort of business coach I worked with was also a lawyer. And as she was helping me to come up with my liability waivers and service agreements, she was really pushing me to offer packages, you know, and she and I, and I said, I don't even want to offer a package yet. Like I'm just getting started. I want to let people book one session. I don't want to force someone into a longer journey. I'm, I'm just figuring it out. And she was like, in a business sense, that doesn't necessarily make sense. But for me, I really wanted to get the experience first and work with as many people as possible and not hold them to necessarily having to commit yet. Yeah. But over the years, you know, of 
leading a lot of one-on-one healing sessions, leading a lot of group healing sessions. Um, I then strategically looked at my business and how I could grow it and how I would be able to reach more people. And that also happened. It was happening before the pandemic. Um, incredibly so, which is also so lucky, you know, my business doubled when we went into lockdown. Um, but I was set up for it. I had led my first zoom sound bath in December of 2019. There was a, the last full moon of the decade. <laughs> Nice. And I held it on Zoom and 80 people bought tickets, you know, and that was before anyone was doing virtual, really anything. People didn't even know what Zoom was, Yeah. Um, but I had felt a call. And in the beginning of 2020, I was in India just before lockdown and I was feeling this call. It was like, don't do the in-person events that you have planned. It was like, let's look at the calendar again and put everything virtual. So I was planning to make this shift got back from India. We went into lockdown. Um, my then boyfriend, now husband took me to the guitar store and was like, we got to get you the best microphones possible. And I did. And right off the bat in COVID, um, I was able to share virtually when people were really desperately in need of a way to connect and a way to relax. Yeah. So what incredible foresight. And that does bring me, I want to, I want to ask you questions about microphones, but, um, yeah, you just couldn't even, that's just divine intervention, luck, or something. Something, something bigger than me. I think it's just trusting. Like, <laughs> And it, I didn't, like, I was like, why am I doing things virtually? You know, this isn't what I want. Like, I love being in person, yeah, but I'm yeah. just going to trust, you know? And that led me to be set up to share with hundreds and thousands of people in a single sound bath and then to create I had so many recordings from sharing virtually that I could create a membership that had a solid foundation to build upon so people who wanted to commit to deeper healing and who still want to I still have the membership it's incredible um they could immediately access this on-demand library that was super high quality and then get the live virtual experiences as well you know and then I created a, a mini course to teach other sound healers how they can share virtually too. So what microphones they need to buy, how to use Zoom or why you might use YouTube instead. Um, and then I had been mentoring healers one-on-one -on -one for quite some time and I had an in-person training, but I took all of that online as well and held group mentorships, took the training online and then created a new training, which is the training I now lead, the Sound Healers Academy that is a three month certification training that teaches you not only how to lead a sound bath in person and virtually, but also how to build a business doing it that sets you up for success in the long run. So it's been this incredible unfolding of like, I've just followed the breadcrumbs of like, okay, now I'm online. Okay, people wanna learn, let me teach them. Okay, people wanna learn how to use microphones, let me teach them. And just even in those moments when I felt afraid and like, who am I to do this? I just trust and I do it and it's worked out beautifully <laughs> that's amazing that's so cool i i hope i'm not sounding like devil's advocate here but if i'm i've taken a crystal bowl or taken a bowl and mm -hmm. i move the stick around it and i go well that's nice that sounds good why would and then i ask the question why would i need to take a training can you such answer? a great question because such a great question mm -hmm. it seems kind of easy right so I just do this thing around the bowl, right? Super easy. So then can you explain to me how I could benefit from taking your training? 100%. So it, and this is why my training is three months. And a big part of the training is personal practice. We help hold you accountability, help hold you accountable to your own personal healing, you know, and really getting to know and love and understand inside and out your bowls, what they do and the relationship that you have with them because the bowls will sound different when you play them for yourself they'll sound different when you play them for this group versus that group in this place versus that place and a part of being a really tuned in sound healer is being able to understand those subtleties and let that guide you you know to serve whether it's yourself in a personal healing or the group or client that you're working with so I, I did not take a quote unquote training outright. Like I am not technically even a certified sound healer myself, but I deeply committed myself to my personal practice, my personal healing. I worked with several mentors. I paid a lot of money to 
hire business coaches, you know, in order to build the business side of things, lawyers, um, people to help me build my brand. I've read every book I can find on sound healing. And to this day, I know that I need to stay committed to my own personal practice and personal exploration of sound healing. Um, or I won't be able to serve in that same way as the clear vessel. And I think it can be tricky for people to make that commitment. I think we have really good intentions, but sometimes staying accountable to a 40 day practice or a 90 day practice that can then turn into a lifelong practice. We need some support to get going, you know? So that's what the training offers is that support. And also those other perspectives. It's not just me leading the training, but you know, I'm not a complete master in music theory yet. I know a lot, but I bring in a master so that she can give you another perspective and deeper understanding of music theory from a more academic perspective, you know? So you no. get a lot of, a lot of different people's wisdom in addition to that accountability that is all designed to teach you that you have everything you need within yourself. Great answer. I love that. That's really cool. Shifting the focus toward developing your own personal experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's cool. Very cool. Mm -hmm. It's funny while you were saying that it made me think one of your students and or partners, Caroline Batoff, who came mm -hmm. here to the studio and offered a sound bath here, I think it was about a month ago. Mm -hmm. And um, she was really kind as well to come and offer a little bit of sound bath after one of our public classes just to help mm -hmm. generate interest, right? Just to let people get a chance to meet her and see her face to face and for her to actually come into the room. So when um, she did that, I, afterward, I said, would you like me to help you pack your bowls up? And she was like, no, that's okay. I'd, I'd like to do it myself because <laughs> I love my bowls. <laughs> I don't want anybody carrying my bowls around and dropping my bowls hit my bowls on the doorway on the way in and out. And I, so when you were saying like just that process of developing care mm -hmm. and having something that you care for and, yeah. and, and it, treating it seriously or with respect mm -hmm. is a really neat element for like the cornerstone of a training program, as opposed to like what sounds like if you're saying, I'm just going to teach you how to play the bowls. I'm going to teach you how to move the stick around that type of thing, which I'm sure you do do, mm -hmm. but I mean, mm -hmm. That that little shift, that's a neat idea. Like that gets my wheel spinning in relation just to everything. Yeah, no, it's so true. And and you hit the nail on the head with the example you shared with Caroline. It teaches you to be so clear and confident and grounded within yourself, right? So that you know how you move through the world, whether it's, I mean, packing up your bowls. And we literally talk about that in the training. What do you do when someone asks to touch your bowls? What do you do when someone <laughs> offers to help? And and some people are totally fine with letting other people carry their bowls, but how can you feel okay saying, thank you, no, thank you, you know, and, and yeah. that is being grounded. That is being authentic without feeling bad. And I don't want to be mean. I don't want to hurt your feelings. You know, like when is it aligned for you to receive help? And when is it actually a sacred? No, you know, when you said that, is that something that you also utilize in relation to someone who comes up to you today and says, here, have a drink? Oh, the, yeah. The thank, you, no, <laughs> the thank you, no, thank you element, like navigating. Yeah, everything. absolutely. And when I first got sober, there was a part of me that felt like I needed to explain myself and, you know, I don't drink and it's for the best or, you know, make a joke, make light of it. But now it's like, if someone were to offer me a drink, it's like, no, thanks. You know, like, I don't feel like I need to explain it or justify it. Just thank you. No, thank you. It's, nice. I'm so crystal clear in it. Nice. Nice. Mm -hmm. What do you have on the horizon? I know, I know you have horizon tomorrow and um, <laughs> like you're starting this program. You'll be very, you'll be busier, active with it for the year. Mm -hmm. in a maybe larger picture. If you have like a dream that goes a little further down the track, what are you um, contemplating these days or, or. I know sometimes when I ask this question that maybe the obvious answer would be, well, I'm a yogi, so I don't think too far in the future, but do you, <laughs> I'm just present. <laughs> I just live in the present. I'm not worried about the future, but um, where, where, where are you the, these days with, with those sort of ideas? Well, I am present and, you know, and I trust the path as it unfolds and those little breadcrumbs come through and I have a few, few nuggets that I'm sort of meditating on and opening to, um, so, I mean, first of all, with the Sound Healers Academy, the level one training, um, 
my hope is to continue to grow it and to continue to, you know, build it as what I feel it is, which is the best sound healing training in the world. You know, I know there's nothing else out there like it. And my intention is for that to be known in all corners of the world. You know, we've had people from almost every continent at this point, but I would love to grow it so that we continue to have sold out classes and this incredible global community with more retreats and a bigger team of mentors supporting and more incredible masterclass teachers coming in. So my hope is to continue to grow that. Um, and then the other sort of nuggets that come through that have been coming through really strongly for me right now are just how can I continue to serve more deeply? So I see myself on big stages, you know, just as I'm like scared to say this, but it's, it's true. Like just as there's been so much hype around Taylor Swift's current tour, like I would love for that much hype to be around a sound bath. And I would love to be the one on the stage where people are like, I want to relax. I want to heal, sign me up, get me there. I want to experience this magic in person, you know? So a big part of my dream is bringing sound healing to the world, to world stages and, and supporting other people and doing the same. Yes. I see myself on the stages, but I also, I want that to be common for everyone who's taken my training. Everyone who says, I feel the call to be an embodied sound healer. Like I want that for all of us. You know, I want there to be, I want healing to be just as cool as a pop concert. <laughs> That's cool. I, I mean, as you were saying that, I was trying to visualize if you were on stage, like if Taylor got off the stage and you got up and this is huge stadium <clears throat> as in it, what is the, <clears throat> excuse me, what is the largest event that you've seen that is as close to a sound bath? Cause I mean, sometimes when I think like, I don't know, like a really great rock show, like for example, I think of like Freddie Mercury and Queen playing to that stadium, like massive london mm -hmm. stadium or whatever mm -hmm. and in some respects that probably could have created some sort of healing for people right like where music in general is yeah. extremely healing and powerful so i guess two questions one the first one i just mentioned like mm -hmm. uh, what is the largest one you've seen and then second how do you differentiate say a queen performance that just totally rocks you and you come out going, and not that I got to see Queen, but just something of that nature where you come out, or maybe just Taylor, you come out of Taylor's yeah. concert going, I feel so amazing. How do you differentiate those two? Great or question. are there are there any differences? Yeah. So for your first question, I'll answer it in a couple of parts. For me, the biggest venue that I've played at, the biggest experience I've had the opportunity to create was I got to play on stage at the Hollywood Bowl in Los Angeles, which the capacity wow. of, of that space is 14,000 people. Yeah. <laughs> no way. Um, I got to play with the yeah. Los Angeles Philharmonic. So that was an incredible honor. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And just a, a dream come true and, and definitely oh, cool. validated my vision of being on big stages. Um, I've also seen, you know, my friend Jackie Cantwell, she does a lot with the big quiet and they had partnered with um, uh, Daybreaker and Oprah and went on tour around the country. And so Jackie is an incredible sound healer. She's played at Barclays Center. You know, that that's, I mean, as big as it gets. So what, what, is, what is the great quiet? Um, it's, it's the big quiet. The big I'm quiet. Sorry, the big quiet, my bad. Um, Jesse Israel, it's a it's a meditation movement. It's it's really amazing. It's worth looking into. They hold yeah. mass meditations. Yeah. Really cool. 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 Mm -hmm. And then your differentiation answer. And then the differentiation answer, um, I would say it's sort of just how you feel just as, just as someone would feel different going to a queen concert versus a Taylor concert versus a Metallica concert, right? Um, going to a sound bath, it's really designed with the intention of going there to heal and connect and relax. There's definitely a more spiritual element. I mean, even a Coldplay concert, I know Chris Martin, he's super tapped in. Like that can be a, a really spiritual experience. Any music performance can be a spiritual experience, I feel. But the consciousness part of it, and I think the intention of bringing healing, um, that is the big differentiating factor. And Jonathan Goldman, who's one of the most renowned sound healers, he always says that intention plus frequency equals healing. So like, if Taylor were to get on stage and play a song and be like, hey, everyone, the intent, or even just to say to herself, the intention is to really provide the group with a profound heart healing. 
which I mean, many of her songs are kind of breakup songs. They definitely do. You know? <laughs> they do. I love Taylor. But in yeah. a different way. So I think to go to a sound bath in a venue like that, or even not a venue like that, but in a yoga studio, like it's the intention of going to heal, maybe to connect with a higher version of yourself, to get clarity, um, and to go within, you know, that's a part of it. At most of those concerts, you're kind of guided to have your eyes open. No one's saying like, close your eyes and, and go within You're you're outward, you're with friends. It's more of a party vibe, which is also really fun. There's value in all of it. That's cool. Do you allow yourself the guilty pleasure of a little bit of Metallica every now and again, or do you, do you stay? It's not, not a guilty pleasure. It's not, it's not, it's not <laughs> a style of music that I really <laughs> resonate with. Any punk rock or like heavy stuff or, or not so much? Not so much. I mean, okay, my husband's really into emo music. So like, I'm, I'm down for that, but I mean, the last concert I went to, I was pregnant. It was last year. I think that was the last concert it was John Mayer. So I love. Cool. Yeah. He's that was great. Yeah. I went to two, I was like 39 weeks pregnant. I was about to pop and I, I had floor seats and that was really fun. I was like, <laughs> this baby's going to love music, but he is yeah, that's cool. Mm -hmm. So one, one thing I noticed, we have our, our public classes, uh, live on zoom and I record them. And when I have music in the background on my little speaker, then because my speaker is like in the middle of the room, it'll pick up my voice and it'll drown out the sound. But then when I stop mm -hmm. talking, it'll pick up the sound. And when I listen to the recording back, it's got this crazy kind of not pleasant sounding garbly experience. So mm -hmm. with your professional advice, how could I improve my sound quality in this type of setting? So first of all, my virtual mini course goes into this exact topic. Um, mm -hmm. And you don't so have to give me those there. answers right now. Oh no, like, I will. It's such secrets, a simple but... fix. So in your Zoom audio settings, there's a setting that you can choose, which is um, original sound for musicians. Oh. If, and you just check the box in the settings in the bottom left corner, you go that, you go to audio settings, you open it and it says, um, original sound for musicians re recommended for studio environments. It's as opposed to zoom optimized audio. And then in the top left corner of your screen, it'll be a little black bar that says original sound for musicians off. And I'll give you a little sample. So right now, if I play my singing bowl, yeah, please, it's not going to sound very good. Yeah. Get in and out. Right. But, yeah. and I haven't done a sound check for bowls right now. So bear with me. If I turn it on. I sound a little bit different, right? Like you can kind of hear the background noise. It probably sounds a little different, but the bowl comes through. Oh, wow. So simple fix. All you need to do is get your original sound for musicians. Oh my off, gosh. Or you could share screen. I would, I would share your audio. That's what I would recommend is rather than playing it on a speaker, um, oh. Play it from your computer speaker if there's also students live in the room, and then just do share screen. And when you do share screen, you press um, enable share audio. Oh my gosh. I'm going to go back and listen and watch everything you just said. <laughs> Not play with my Zoom right now during the podcast. I don't want to mess anything up, but that's so cool. I really appreciate that information. Yes, I've been yes you that. just got upgraded. Everyone I'm, go, I'm to, go to Todd's class. It's about to be on the next level. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. When you were in India, you mentioned that you were in India right before COVID and maybe mm -hmm. you've done multiple trips, but mm -hmm. um, I'm curious how, so I've had a chance to go to India and they have an incredible music culture, bhakti yoga and people playing harmonium and drums. And I mean, it's, it's incredible, but I can't remember hearing a crystal bowl played in India, but I do remember meeting people on the street that were selling like the Tibetan bowls that were made mm -hmm. more out of. I don't even know what those are made out of what kind of metal seven metals. But... typically traditional seven metals yeah and so I'm, I'm curious how is the the culture in India um use of these crystal bowls is it widespread in India or is this more of a like what is the history of the crystal bowl kind of to where we are today like has there been a little bit of like an evolution with this 
Yes. So interestingly enough, crystal bowls are not an Eastern tradition, not an Eastern sound healing tradition. Um, they were actually discovered or invented in the 80s. They were used, the big frosted bowls were used to bake computer chips in Silicon Valley. What? So people then started to play them and realized that, oh my gosh, there's something here. Let me play with this. Let me explore this. And there's a few sort of tech nerds out there who worked in the tech space who got really into um, crystals and like energy work through crystals. You know, there's a piece of clear quartz crystal inside of each of our computers and our cell phones. It's used as a conductor of energy. So that's how crystal singing bowls came to be. So you wouldn't find them as a traditional form of, you know, healing or, or musical instruments in India. The Tibetan metal bowls, those are very common harmoniums beautiful um that last time that I was in India I, I was lucky enough I had the opportunity to play play my crystal bowls at the international yoga festival in Rishikesh which was amazing oh yeah it was it was That's very cool. very cool such an honor oh my god did mm -hmm. you know you're going to be able to do that when you were going to be going to India and brought the bowls with you or were you just in India and somebody said oh why don't you come do this so I was in India on a trip with one of my dearest teachers, Tommy Rosen, who is a leader in the recovery space and also a great Kundalini yoga teacher. So I was there with him and his wife, Kia, and they were teaching at the International Yoga Festival. So I was sort of there with them. And while I was there, um, he invited me on stage and a couple of other teachers ended up inviting me to come on stage at their classes, which was That's so cool. special. It was amazing nice. to get to support them. Yeah. What a cool opportunity. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, Susie. Well, this is such a pleasure to get a chance to actually speak with you and talk with you. I, I really, I feel lucky. Thank you so much for <laughs> taking time out of your day and getting ready for a nice busy year long training session. And it sounds like lots of other things going on. Thank is you so anything, much for having me. <laughs> oh, of course. Is there, is there anything else that you feel like you'd like to share or any other, uh, another message or different angle to the message that you've already talked about that you think the listeners can, can benefit from in the attempt to start to close our conversation? I would just say that if you're listening to this podcast, it's for a reason, there's no mistake or coincidence. And sound healing is such a special modality because it's really accessible to everyone, you know, and sound goes beyond any language, you know, it just is this pure resonance. And if you're someone who struggles with meditation or struggles to relax, I would say have an open mind and just give sound healing a shot. You know, there's so much available online. I have free resources online on YouTube, on my website, on my Instagram, I have an online membership. If you're somewhere where, I mean, at this point, I would say there's in-person sound healing almost everywhere. You know, it's really popping up quickly. Someone, one of, one of my students the other day was like, sound healers are, are becoming like Starbucks. There's, they're popping up. <laughs> I'm like, yes, what a great thing. <laughs> there's no shortage of people who could benefit from sound healing. <laughs> Better yet, it'd be cool if when I go into Starbucks, there's somebody in the corner there just like, Ooh. right? That's yeah. I'll put that on my collaboration list. Would, yeah. <laughs> Back to Starbucks, right? Starbucks <laughs> hires you to, to to have a sound a sound bowl healer in every location. That would be cool. Could you imagine? No, but oh, in all seriousness, yeah. no, like, I know, right? <laughs> if you're listening and you're curious, just give it a try and and see. You know, literally, all you need to do is listen. You can do it seated. You can do it lying down. You don't have to be flexible. You don't have to be a good meditator. It's something that you know, it could potentially help you feel a little bit more connected to yourself and more at peace. So if I can ever serve you, if you'd like to connect, I would love to, or if you'd like to be connected with someone locally, you know, Caroline's, Caroline's in Florida, I'm in LA. I know people in between and beyond. Um, I would be happy to be of service in any way I can. Oh, thanks so much, Susie. That's really sweet. And all of your links that you just mentioned are right below. So people can just like, whether they're watching on YouTube, they can click or listening, they can just like click. It's going to be super easy. Amazing. Amazing. Well, oh. thank you, Susie. I mean, the world is a better place if we're positive and pumping out good vibes and you're definitely doing that. So I'm so honored to have this um, opportunity and I can't wait to either join in on one of your trainings or see you on zoom, or I know you're on Instagram all the time. So I, I'll get a chance to see you again here, which I'm excited for. So thank you so much. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>